Right, so notice that the title of this video is Should We Put Telescopes on Mars? Not Could We Put Telescopes on Mars? So this isn't about, you know, how we build stuff on Earth, ship it to Mars, construct it there and communicate. Like, I'm assuming that that's all been sorted, right? Maybe humans have even already got a settlement on Mars or something. If we've sorted all that out, is it then a good idea to put telescopes on Mars? So this question actually came from a subscriber on Twitter. So Taha Flutter on Twitter, hi Taha, surprise by the way, <laughs> um, they tweeted me to ask, Dear Dr. Becky, is Mars's atmosphere suitable for a huge land-based telescope? If yes, how significantly better would it be compared to Earth-based telescopes? And do you envision when we settle on Mars, building telescopes even would be considered, right? And I said, good question, leave it with me. So this leave it with me is this video right now. Um, and I love getting questions from people on Twitter. I think it's awesome. Like if you have questions that you wanna see me answer in videos, then my handle is at Dr. Becky with an underscore, tweet them at me or leave them in the comments and maybe I'll surprise you with a video one day as well. So the key thing we have to consider here is Mars's atmosphere. So the atmosphere on Earth is actually very good at blocking lots of different wavelengths on the full electromagnetic spectrum. So this is the full, spectrum of wavelengths of light that you can get from the longest wavelengths at radio waves through to the, towards the UV and the visible light that we actually see with our own eyes at quite short wavelengths and shorter even still to like X-ray and gamma ray as well. Now there's a very well-known transmission spectrum from Earth, i.e. what wavelengths of light are actually transmitted through the atmosphere down to us on the surface. And when you see it, you notice that most of the wavelength of light shorter than visible light, so this is like UV, X-ray, gamma ray, none of that actually reaches us at the surface, which is a pretty good thing for life, <laughs> um, because if you're constantly being bombarded by super high energy radiation from space, it's not necessarily a good thing. And you'll also notice that it gets a little bit messy around about the infrared regime, which is sort of the wavelength slightly longer than visible light, where it lets through some areas and not others. We call these transmission windows. There's a window in the atmosphere that lets us see at that wavelength of light in the infrared. And then you get up to higher wavelengths, sort of into the microwave and what we call the submillimeter. They're blocked again until you get this really wide window in the radio regime. So we have lots of radio telescopes on Earth because we radio waves penetrate Earth's atmosphere and so we can see them from the ground. So the reason that Earth's transmission spectrum has the shape is because of the different components in the Earth's atmosphere. And so what wavelengths of light are actually transmitted in that spectrum all comes down to what elements you've got in your atmosphere. Now Earth's atmosphere is something like 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and there's a trace amounts of carbon dioxide, argon, water vapor, and all of these things combine to give you that spectra of what gets absorbed and what gets transmitted. Because some of those molecules, when light hits them, light at the very right wavelength, it likes to absorb them and use them to get more energetic molecules instead and do stuff with it. For example, when the right kind of wavelength of light hits oxygen, it causes it to what's called disassociate. So oxygen is O2, it's two molecules of oxygen bound together. If a really high energy particle comes in, like a UV or an X-ray particle, hits that oxygen, it causes it to break apart. And then each of those things will then combine with another molecule of O2, making O3, which is ozone, which is why we have a really thick ozone layer around the Earth, is because all those particles come in from space, they hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere where there's a lot of oxygen, and you create this boundary of O3, ozone. Mars's atmosphere, though, is very different to Earth's. So Mars's atmosphere is about 95% carbon dioxide, and then trace amounts of nitrogen and argon again, and then a little bit of water vapor and a tiny amount of oxygen. So that's gonna give you a different transmission spectrum for all the light that's gonna reach the Martian surface. So that means we might actually be able to do different observations from Mars's surface that we're not able to do from the ground on Earth. Um, so I'm gonna go through it regime by regime on the electromagnetic spectrum, and I'm gonna start at the really high energy end, the stuff with the really tiny short wavelengths that's super energetic. So I'm talking about gamma rays, X-ray, and UV. We can't observe any of these from the Earth's surface because of that ozone layer that I mentioned before. So gamma ray astronomy, X-ray astronomy, and UV astronomy are all done from space because we just can't see anything like that from the ground. So anything to do with really high energy stuff like 
um, active galactic nuclei where you've got supermassive black holes, uh, accreting material and glowing really brightly, uh, supernova, neutron stars, pulsars, all of that light is blocked to us from Earth. So we can't find anything about that side of the universe from Earth. On Mars, however, there's only trace amounts of oxygen. So it's not like there's a, a large amount in the upper atmosphere that when that stuff is coming in, it's gonna get blocked by uh, and cause that ozone layer. There is a tiny amount of ozone on Mars. There's, it's kind of seasonal in, in how it changes with sort of all of the movement around of air on the planet in the atmosphere as it gets heated and cooled down. There is a known to be a collection on the poles, but it means there is no ozone layer on Mars. If there's no ozone layer, then all you're really dependent on is the amount of air you're then traveling through. That's what we call something called the column density. If you took a meter squared patch on the surface of a planet and then you looked at how much air is actually in that sort of straight column up, you'll find that the column density is about a hundred times less on Mars than it is on Earth. So it's a lot of a thinner atmosphere. So it means there's not even gonna be as much light blocked on its way down either. And this is why when we've actually looked to see if we can see gamma rays coming from radioactive rocks on Mars' surface, we've actually been able to detect them with satellites in orbit around Mars. So the gamma rays have actually got from the surface of Mars through the atmosphere to the satellite that way. So therefore we should technically be able to get gamma rays from space down to the surface of Mars through the atmosphere as well to any observatory that we build down there. In the UV though, you've got another problem. You've got something that's called Rayleigh scattering. So Rayleigh scattering is when you have a light wave that comes in and hits a particle that's about a tenth of its wavelength. And then what happens is it gets scattered away by that particle. So you have less directional light coming to the ground. Instead, you end up with light scattering all the way into the atmosphere and, and out back into space again. And so the same thing happens on Mars, but the particles are obviously a different size in Mars's atmosphere because it's mostly CO2. And so that really starts to hit around about a hundred nanometer wavelength, which is like right sort of on the edge of the UV. So it means that anything less than that, we won't actually be able to see on Mars, but between sort of like hundred nanometers and like 400 nanometers where you're getting into the visible light again, you should be able to see UV light from space on Mars. Right, into the visible wavelengths. So optical observatories on Earth tend to be put in high up, dry, remote places. So they're remote because it's away from light pollution, which is fine on Mars, there's no light pollution on Mars. They're in dry places because water vapor in the atmosphere can massively affect your observations. So it can cause light particles to scatter away and give you sort of really fuzzy images. The same way that like when you look through a mirage on a hot day where you've got like water rising above a hot road, everything seems to be distorted behind it. They're then in high up places, not to be closer to space or anything because you know it's like a fractional amount of distance compared to the distance that you're actually observing sources at in space but actually to look through less atmosphere. So the thinner your atmosphere, the better because there's less particles to scatter away light or to absorb light on its way down to you. Now Mars's atmosphere is a lot thinner than ours. That's because it's not actually been able to hold on to its atmosphere. So Mars actually doesn't have a magnetic field. So Earth's magnetic field comes from the fact that it's got a liquid core around its iron core and all of the charged iron particles moving around in this liquid iron core set up currents which is basically electricity moving if you have electricity moving you're going to set up a magnetic field so mars's core is solid and so it doesn't actually have a magnetic field now that might not sound like a big deal but actually a magnetic field is kind of an extra protective shield around a planet so our sun is actually very, very active and it can throw off these sort of huge burps of very high energy particles that we call a solar wind. Now those particles hit the Earth's magnetic field, they travel down magnetic field lines to the poles and they make the aurora, which is a beautiful sight for us. But Mars hasn't got that protection from its magnetic field. So those solar particles, very high energy, just blast straight at its atmosphere. And so slowly over the years, that atmosphere has been stripped so Mars's atmosphere is a lot thinner. Thinner atmosphere means less of it for actually light to travel through, so less chance of it being absorbed or scattered. So actually optical observation should be better on Mars, but that probably won't be the case because of astronomers' greatest fear, dust. 
We all know Mars is incredibly, incredibly dusty. There are dust storms that travel all around the planet and can actually completely block out the sun. And that's actually recently what's happened to the Curiosity rover. It got caught in a dust storm. Its solar batteries could never replenish themselves. It got too cold in the Martian temperatures and unfortunately, uh, its electronics are no longer working. And also think about Mark Watney in The Martian. Dust storm hit him and he wasn't getting enough energy from his solar powered batteries either. So they're a big problem on Mars. So if you built an optical observatory, yes, you would be able to see things a lot better, but if you got a dust storm hit you, you'd be weathered out the exact same way that you would be on Earth as well by a rainstorm. Now infrared, doesn't care about dust. Infrared can see right through dust. It's why we use infrared as astronomers as well, is because a lot of really interesting regions in galaxies are hidden by a lot of dust. So stars like to form in dusty regions. There tends to be a lot of dust around the center of galaxies as well, blocking the supermassive black hole and anything that's going on there. So if you use infrared light, we can see through that dust, which is great. So we don't need to worry about Martian dust if we were gonna build an infrared telescope. They're great, right? But not so much, because if we go back to what happens on Earth, we can break it down into the different elements that cause that blocking. And you can see that actually the majority of infrared light is blocked by carbon dioxide, <laughs> which is the main component of Mars's atmosphere. So the rest of the infrared light on Earth is actually blocked by H2O vapor in the atmosphere, which we know we have a lot of clouds, H2O vapor, etc. And there's a very specific signature in the infrared that actually comes from methane. And H2O vapor blocks that signature from methane. And that might not sound exciting. What do we care about methane for? Well, actually most of the methane on Earth comes from cow farts. Yes, I did just say, cow farts, a bovine inflatulence, if you want like a scientific term for it. And methane gives out a very strong signature, a very specific wavelength in infrared light. And if say an alien was observing planet Earth to try and work out if there was life on planet Earth, one of the things they would look for might be that methane signature in the infrared, but actually all the water vapor in our atmosphere completely blocks that signature in the infrared. Now Mars has about 10,000 times less water vapor in its atmosphere than Earth, but it's actually still enough to block that signature from methane. So really, I don't think Mars is gonna be any better for our infrared observing than we do already have on Earth. Okay, so now into the radio regime and radio astronomy. Now radio astronomy kind of umbrellas everything from the edge of the infrared regime, like the sub millimeter that we call it wavelengths, through the microwave and the radio. Kind of all of that is classed as radio astronomy. And if you're wondering why do we bother even observing the sky in radio waves? Well, there's a lot we can see in radio waves. Again, like supermassive black holes accreting material we can see in radio waves. We know that the Big Bang exists because we can observe the cosmic microwave background with radio telescopes. Is this signal that we see from everywhere in the universe that's kind of like an echo of the Big Bang. But if we can already do it on Earth, why would we bother putting them on Mars anyway? The thing is your resolution of a telescope is really proportional to your wavelength. So the higher the wavelength, the greater the resolution you can get. The lower the wavelength, the lower the resolution you can get with the same sized telescope. So for radio waves, you need massive telescopes to get even the same amount of detail you would get with a small optical telescope. The way we get around this on Earth is by building either huge arrays of lots of antenna in, you know, sort of empty spaces like deserts where there's loads of room, or we build a dish on one side of the planet and a dish on another side of the planet, and then we combine them so that they make technically one giant telescope so we can see even smaller things. We basically make a telescope out of the entirety of planet Earth. So what we could do is, we got a lot of space on Mars. There's lots of flat areas, lots of planes. We could put in a huge array of antennas to do radio observations from Mars because also there's not gonna be a lot of interference on Mars either. Every time a satellite goes over on Earth, you tend to get radio interference. Or you could build one of these dishes that you could combine with the ones on Earth so that you haven't just got a planet-sized radio telescope, you've got a solar system-sized radio telescope, which would be really, really cool. So yes, you could definitely build telescopes on Mars and it would definitely be feasible to do observations there, but this atmosphere obviously does get in the way. What about our own moon though? We could build telescopes on there and we don't even have to worry 
about the fact that you've got transmission of light through the atmosphere. There's nothing there to absorb or scatter at all. So the fact that the moon doesn't have an atmosphere is yes, also a pro, but it's also a con. Because atmospheres are kind of useful in that they burn up a lot of space debris, like asteroids as well. Whereas on the moon, you don't have that. So any asteroid that might hit the moon is going to hit the surface and could possibly destroy your telescope. We actually saw an asteroid hit the moon last month in January 2019 during the lunar eclipse, the blood moon. People all around the world at the same time on all the live streams spotted a bright point source on the very uh, edge of the moon that turned out to be an, actually an asteroid hitting the moon during the eclipse. And we know that happens a lot because the moon's surface is incredibly, incredibly cratered. The far side of the moon even more so because it kind of acts as like a space hoover, hoovering up a lot of the asteroids that might be coming towards Earth with its own gravity. But at the end of the day, we have telescopes in space at all of the wavelengths of light that I've talked about in this video, that our observatories now observing space in those wavelengths and are better than anything we can get on Earth. Problem is obviously that space telescopes are really expensive. Now, I imagine they're probably gonna be cheaper than building a telescope on another planet. However, at the minute, it's difficult to get those kind of things funded. So I think we need to stop dreaming of Mars and sending humans to Mars because we've already sent rovers and robots to Mars and they're doing a great job. So instead I think we should be thinking about sending more telescopes into space so they can make a bigger difference but a little bit closer to home. So I just want to give a big shout out to Nick Heavens at Hampton University who is a Martian atmosphere expert who I emailed last week while I was doing research for this video with one simple question and he emailed me back with the answers to 10 more that I didn't even think to ask, which was incredible. So thank you very much to Nick. If you like this video, make sure to hit subscribe and the little bell notification icon because the next notification you get from me could be me answering one of your questions that you posted me on Twitter, either at Dr. Becky with an underscore or in the comments down below. So I will look forward to reading all of those and I will see you next time. So let's leave the visible and head into the infrared. Infrared. Oh, Wake up, Becky. Blah. So the Earth's atmosphere is made of about 70% nitrogen, about 25% oxygen. Is that even right? I don't even know the components of Earth's atmosphere off the top of my head. The blue light out of the sky. Sorry, there's people outside. Why do you have to be so conversational when I'm trying to film? <sighs> Strung up like a moose and then I peter and I bite. Blinded by a zodiacal light.